Vi ska snart gå över till engelska, men inte riktigt än. För precis innan så vill jag bara säga hej till Karin Altenberg. Karin, kan inte du ställa dig upp och vinka till publiken bara? Så att Karin kommer att komma upp på scen om en stund. Nästa talare kommer hon att samtala med, så ni inte undrar vad är det där för en person. Karin jobbar på, just nu en tjänstledig, men hon jobbar på staben på Riksantikvarieämbetet. Och om ni känner att det här namnet klingar bekant så är hon också författare. And now we are going to switch over to English. I'm going to read a bit. This is the first thing you, you understand, Tiffany. But, well... Um, I have uh, the honor to introduce a sociologist, writer and broadcaster, the author of the recently published and critically acclaimed book, Keeping Their Marbles, how the treasures of the past ended up in museums and why they should stay there. This book was described by John Kerry in the Sunday Times as an outstanding achievement, clear-headed, wide-ranging and incisive. And Henrik Bering, Wall Street Journal, described it as courageous and well-argued. She is also the author of Contesting Human Remains in Museum Collections, The Crisis of Cultural Authority, which looks at the influence at play in the controversy over human remains in museum collections and the value of museums. She researches and writes on the use of the past, heritage, and conflicts over culture. Ladies and gentlemen, Tiffany Jenkins. Thank you. Stage is yours. Thank you. I think I'll stand here. Yeah, you so can I'm move the, the table around as you wish. Oh, yeah. thank you. Do what you want. <laughs> thank you. I won't dance. It's a bit early for that. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here um, to come and talk. It's a privilege and it's an honor. Um, I research um, conflicts over the past, and I understand that you've been having quite a heated debate recently about the past of museums um, and how it's used instrumentally. And what I want to do really is reflect on some of those ideas, um, but taking a longer view, um, looking at history and an international view. So let's see, now look, the, I've got a few slides. Um, these are some of my favorite exhibits. They're in the British Museum. They are Assyrian sculptures, and they are dated from about 850 BC, so they're astonishingly old. They're originally a striking feature of palaces and temples um, in what is modern-day Iraq. Uh, these ones flanked the palace of a king and they glorified his reign. They were excavated in the 19th century by a traveler and explorer called Henry Layard. They then had been forgotten, they were covered in dirt, they were unknown and he rediscovered them. What's really interesting to me is the way in which they were received when they entered the British Museum. So this is in about 1860. They attracted a lot of attention but they also attracted considerable concern. Um, people in Britain were concerned about the impact of these artifacts on the British public. They were concerned that they might have a negative impact. And there was even a parliamentary inquiry into how these artifacts should be introduced into British collections. This is what one person asked, a senior person, he said, do you think there is no fear that by introducing freely into the institution objects of more occasional and peculiar interest, such as, for instance, the sculptures from Nineveh, like the ones that I just showed you, do you think that might not deteriorate the public taste and less incline them than they otherwise would be to study works of great antiquity and great art? So there was a concern that these might corrupt the public taste. Um, in particular, there was a concern that these sculptures might corrupt the public taste when it comes to the Elgin marbles. I'm sure you all know 
the Elgin marbles. They're the ones in the British Museum, not in the Acropolis. The response from a senior member of the committee was in the negative. He said, I look upon it that the value of the Nineveh marbles will be the history that their inscriptions, if they are ever translated, which they were, will produce, for it is very bad art. So this stuff's rubbish, is basically what he's saying. So in the 19th century, when those sculptures were introduced to the British Museum, there was quite a firm ideal about the greatest work of art and perfection. And that, for most people then, could be found in these marble sculptures from ancient Athens. So here we have the ones in the Acropolis Museum on the left, the ones in the British Museum that they want back on the bottom left, and where they originally were and still are to a degree um, in ancient Athens. So there was a real concern that those artifacts might displace in the public's eye the beauty and the greatness um, of these ancient sculptures. But interestingly, that image we have of ancient Athens is a reasonably recent construction. So when the Elgin marbles first arrived, long before the Assyrian sculptures in Britain in sort of 1802, um, in big ships, uh, in big crates, 200 tons worth from Athens. When they first arrived and were taken finally out of their boxes, there was a huge debate about their quality. So at that time, collectors in England were enthralled to ancient Rome. Um, you'll know those Roman sculptures that you see in the various museums and galleries. These are poised and perfect pieces. They're not broken, they're not battered, they're not slightly off-white, they're all shiny and wonderful. Many people then, one person in particular, said of the Elgin marbles, but they're a mass of old ruins. These things hadn't been seen, actually, um, because of the way in which um, the Ottoman Empire was uh, restricted access to ancient Greece, um, the, the artifacts of ancient Greece. So it seems incredible now that those things were once seen as broken and battered old, old ruins. But actually, if we look at the history of the Parthenon, you'll know that it has been not just this symbol of ancient Athens and of democracy, but it has been a mosque, it's been a church, it's been a temple. And when Elgin found it at the turn of the century, it was a ruin, it was a quarry, the Turks were using it as a garrison. And it was only just after then that you had this rediscovery of ancient Athens. You had a Bavarian elite who came in and started to run Greece, and the English elite who had in their mind, they fell in love with, with ancient Athens. They were looking for legitimation in some respects. The Prince Otto who came in to run the new state of Greece was looking for a legitimation of his own rule, wanted to kind of distance himself from the most recent past and link himself with the great leaders of antiquity. So he made, helped to make the link between classical antiquities and Greek nationhood inextricable. He tore down the buildings around it. Um, there was a mosque there, and there was all sorts of recent constructions, and he got rid of them, got rid of them all. And at the same time, the English were doing something relatively similar with the Elgin marbles in Britain. Um, rather than it being a big debate when they arrived about who owns them, are they Greek? I mean, Greece didn't exist as a state then. The debate was over their quality and whether they should be acquired on that basis. And many people made the argument that if you had these great works of art in Britain, a number of things would flow from it. Um, new great British art would flow from it the values of that democracy, of freedom, would perhaps be reborn in Britain. Neither happened, it should say, but British Museum did end up with some fantastic artefacts. So my point really is that art and culture and the past has been used throughout history in political ways. Okay, so it's not a new thing in many ways. Um, but what I want to try and unpick is the differences between then and now. So how is the past used today? I want to make the argument that um, you've got to turn towards a much more negative 
kind of past. So the worst of the past is highlighted. Not wonderful ideals of freedom and liberty and beauty, but nastiness and war and the worst aspects of human beings. And I want to argue that instead of having a kind of ideal canon of great works, um, which everybody can perhaps aspire to and relate to, whether it's Greek or Roman, rather than that, um, the idea of culture you have today is much more relative to particular communities. And they're almost like borders around that culture. So it's a negative turn towards the past and a relative turn towards the past that I want, I want to talk about. We've got um, an, a, a recent, obviously politics is changing quite a lot at the moment. But the Prime Minister we had up until recently, David Cameron, is a Conservative Prime Minister. The tradition of conservatism is about conserving the past, um, or at least it was. And there was very much a kind of ideal for some time about the good old days. Um, I think you know what I mean when I talk about the good old days. That would be the something that the Prime Minister of Britain would have once talked about, particularly if he was a Conservative. But one thing he recently said was that um, we don't want to go back to the bad old days. So you have this kind of fixation with the bad old days. I think the good old days have been replaced by the bad old days. Um, you can see this in the emergence of the move towards demands for reparations. Um, it's a really big movement in the States, um, reparations for slavery, whether it's financial or some sort of recognition that takes into account that people may have been born, may have ancestors who were once slaves. So Georgetown, in Washington is beginning to look at recognizing um, slavery in its admissions today. And this is something that's you know, two, three hundred years old. And it's the idea of reparations, that you need to repair the past, that the past is a terrible place and you need to go and make amends for it, is really prominent and really important in the debate over who owns culture. So the Elgin marbles, the Ben and Bronzes, such as these ones, actually. Oh, no, that's the Parthenon when there was a mosque inside. It's a very different picture to the one that we have now of ancient Athens. But these are, in fact, the Ben and Bronzes. These are in the British Museum. They were um, created in Benin, which, which is modern-day Nigeria, southern Nigeria, from the sort of 12th century onwards in what were tremendous flourishing golden ages. Uh, students in Oxford, uh, not in Nigeria, by the way, but in Oxford, want them returned to Nigeria. Um, there's one in Cambridge University that they want to, a cockerel, that they want returned to Nigeria. So the Nigerians haven't asked them about, but the students have campaigned, and it does look that negotiations are in play, and, that, and it will go back. The main reason, although there are two, um, one being that it is African, not British. Uh, but the main reason is that um, because of the sins of colonization. So culture has to be moved around the globe, returned to museums or returned to communities because of what happened 150, 200 years ago. So these objects, which are once some objects of enlightenment, have become objects of apology. So their meaning has changed and their use is changing. When they arrived in Britain um, in the 1900s, late 1800s, 1900s, they transformed or helped to transform the way people saw Africa. The British Museum curator said something along the lines of, we were astonished that a race once considered so barbarous could create something so beautiful. So very reflective of the attitudes of that time, but this, th these works kind of change people's views to a degree. Yet many people now, it is argue it's time for them to go home. As, as with a number of other artifacts, um, when uh, Christopher, when uh, Stephen Fry was arguing for the return of the Elgin marbles, he said because of the way in which Elgin took them, which was very much, incidentally, illegally with the permission of the Ottoman rulers at the time. But we've started to see the past as something that is so bad we need to excavate it and make it 
better. You may have heard of the campaigns that is now sweeping the globe, Spain, parts of Europe, America, to take down statues of people like uh, Cecil Rhodes in Oxford. This is where, obviously, students have nothing better to do but to um, not study their books, but to try and argue for, the for, ta for, for taking down statues. Um, it began in South Africa, but it has spread. It affects culture in a number of other ways, this turn to the past. Um, memorial museums. In the last 30 years, there's been more memorial museums built than in the last 100. Many of these are to the Holocaust, but 9-11, and it's kind of proliferating. Um, and I think you can see it in exhibits. So a couple of years ago in Gothenburg, you had the Stolen Culture exhibition, which was of the Peruvian textiles that had been housed in the collection, but had been taken in the 30s um, illicitly. And a few years ago, the museum exhibited those textiles, not as a way of understanding that ancient culture. These textiles were for the dead. So they were for people once they, were di once they had died. Um, and they are tremendously colorful and intricate and informative and beautiful. Uh, but the exhibition was called A Stolen Culture. A World Elsewhere, the catalog described it as. It was all about how things were acquired in dubious ways rather than the artifacts themselves. So kind of a loss to knowledge. Um, and as many of you will know, unsurprisingly, the Peruvian government wrote and said, you know they say that cult this culture has been stolen, <laughs> that it belongs elsewhere. Well, we want it back. And lo and behold, many of them are going back. So how has this happened and why is it a problem? Um, what is it about the present that makes society turn to the past and the worst aspects of the past? Why does it use culture to try and repair it? And why do I think that's a problem? Well, the past is always seen through the eyes and reasons of the present. Um, we obviously live in fairly interesting political times, and I think one of the reasons for that is that in the last 30 or so years, the fights over the future, which were once so uh, big and ambitious, if conflictual, over the past 30 years have become reined in. Uh, politics has been, up until recently, very much about the status quo. Um, the, in particular, the ambitions of the left have receded, and I think the values of the right have crumbled. And in that context, instead of fighting over what could be and what should be, you have uh, the, ba the past becoming the battleground for all sorts of contemporary conflicts. You know, there used to be a a saying in left-wing organizations which went along the lines of don't mourn, organize. Don't mourn, organize, which recognizes the reality of the situation. So things are difficult and need to be confronted and we need to get on with it even though it's hard. And that has been replaced by a very different attitude, which is we must organize to mourn. We must organize to mourn. So we become um, kind of we search out victim identities and see the worst in each other. In many ways, it's obviously a displacement for the present. Um, and what we're seeing, instead of trying to affect social change in the present, you fight over the past. And it's much easier to blame the past for all sorts of iniquities in the here and now. Um, it lets political leaders off the hook. So in the last 30 or so years, you've had numerous political leaders apologize for something that happened long before their reign. Tony Blair for the potato blight. I think even the Pope got in there. Um, it makes them look good in comparison. It's a way of kind of gaining authority. So here, is, here the past is being used to gain authority by emphasizing the worst aspects of it. Um, finding leaders has been replaced by finding victims. Now this is a real problem, I think, because it's turning the past into a morality play. Um, rather than trying to understand it, um, and understanding that the past is a different country. You know, they do things differently there, uh, to paraphrase. Um, and it flattens it out. It becomes about goodies and baddies. And that's what you often see in conflicts over the repatriation of artifacts. You have uh, 
fear Aboriginal campaigners, having to really prove their victimhood, have to prove how badly off they are now and why, therefore, they should have these artefacts returned to them. And I think it also reflects a certain degree of pessimism about who we are as human beings. Um, there are obviously limitations with worshipping leaders, um, but venerating victims, nobody benefits from that. Um, we end up creating, instead of comp competition really, for victimhood, where everybody has to cry and show how badly they are. are. And you end up having people encouraged to seek identity in suffering. So why culture? It's obviously this turn towards the past and the demand for reparations affects everything, but culture in particular has been called upon to act in this way. And it's not just because I uh, research museums. What's interesting is that up until 30, 40 years ago, they would never have been asked to do some of the things that they are now being asked to do. And I think what you have is a kind of different quality of politicization of culture that has come with the absence of social change and the absence of asking politics to do things and the turn towards culture to succeed in achieving those aims. It has come about at the same time as culture is no longer confident in its own value. So the two things kind of work in a parasitical relationship. Culture, in, certainly in many places I've looked at, has fallen over itself, the cultural sector, to embrace political leaders who tell them, in the words of a new Labour report, that they are centres for social inclusion. They have been too keen to embrace this role because they are unconfident with their original purpose. I want to talk about two examples of this and what it means um, that have taken place really since 2004 in the States. The first is this institution, the Museum of the American Indian in Washington, which opened in 2004. Um, this is described as a highly activist museum, very political in many cases, and an interventionist museum. And one of the reasons why it's quite an interesting case study is because the collection came from a collector called Gorge Just of Kay, it's collecting at the end of the wars between American Indians and the settlers. It was all his stuff. Um, that was very much, it was on show in a museum in New York for many years at the turn of the century. And now that museum here, which opened in 2004, much larger, considerable larger budget, and actually much less is on show. Um, good quality, fascinating items are no longer on show. And if you're a member of a particular tribe, and you have a particular position in the tribe, you can decide what is on show. If it's not on show, how it's cared for, whether it deteriorates, um, and also the content of the exhibitions. It is a museum that is run on the basis of ethnicity. And it's done in the name of helping Native American communities today. So when at the launch, this is what Secretary Adams said, I've no doubt that the launching of the National Museum of the American Indian represents a fundamental turning point for the Smithsonian. So it's the Smithsonian Institute, one of the most, if not the most important institutions in, Brit in, um, in America. And it says, this institution will begin to correct a vast wrong and all the myths and stereotypes with which we surrounded it in order to hide or at least not to confront it ourselves. Its aim is to affirm the lives of Native Americans and to grant them control over telling their own history, partly to repair the past. We must let them correct the wrongs of history. Um, this has had really serious consequences for the pursuit of knowledge. So you cannot see artifacts, you cannot research them, you cannot look at them unless you're of the right ethnicity. And there's a kind of apartheid approach to knowledge there that is extremely dangerous. And had it been a different ethnic group, had it been, say, what about white men? Nobody would put up with it uh, because they know it's wrong and it's dangerous. What we're doing 
with the attempt to use culture in this political way um, is actually to shut down knowledge of those communities. This is the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which has already been mentioned this morning. Now, this was opened in September, um, and I think it's trying to do some of the things that the Native American Museum is doing, but not quite so explicitly. Um, and I think they've learned to a degree about um, the way in which privileging certain identities with certain political positions can have a really detrimental impact upon the collection because it's quite clear when you go to the Museum of Native American that it's just kind of all made up. It's like this very romantic idea and you learn very little about people or their collections. So the aim here is to, is, well, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of it. It took some time for it to be agreed to take place because people were concerned that a museum devoted to one ethnicity would lead to the multiplication of other museums. It was a fragmentation. So what's wrong, many people said, uh, with just having the Museum of American History or a Museum of Slavery? I mean, what happens when you put it as a black museum? Um, will we get Museum of Latinos? Will we get Museum of Transgender? Um, and I think we probably will get that, but the director makes the argument, Lonnie Bunch, that this is, you cannot understand America without understanding black America. And I think there's an interesting argument uh, to make there. But I do think we will see continuation of fragmentation about the past. But the second, the second thing this is meant to do, and this is the words of the, in the words of Lonnie Bunch, the director, he hopes to strike a balance between a narrative of progress and recognizing suffering of the past and how it continues today. He writes in, the, in an essay for the Smithsonian, the museum needs to be a place that finds the right tension between moments of pain and stories of res resiliency and uplift. I hope that the museum can play a small part in helping our nation grapple with its tortured racial past and even help us find a bit of reconciliation. That's quite high expectations for a museum to create reconciliation, to help a nation grapple with its tortured racial past and to find moments of uplift and the recognition of suffering. Serious burden placed on this collection. At the same time, the collection is bitty and weak. I mean, this is the first institution run by the Smithsonian that began without a collection which is a peculiar thing, to imbue objects that don't even exist with the power to do all of that. Um, and I think what you get is two things. One is that uh, you no longer look at objects as historical objects, things that tell you about the past, variety of different pasts, variety of different approaches. You look at them instead of, way of a kind of objects of therapy. That is what they are there to do for you. I think that helps you to, uh, the, d the negative impact of is the way you also approach history is just a morality play. Is it good, is it bad, were they right, were they wrong, uh, rather than as an investigation. And it does put people into little boxes, goodies, baddies, victim, are you, on the so are you white, you must have been therefore involved somehow in slavery or your ancestors were, a kind of almost racializing of people. Now, I was at the opening of this museum. It's really very moving. It's very striking on the National Mall. All the buildings are white, and there's this kind of copper glazed... Well, it actually looks like a bit like a bunker. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, but Obama spoke, and um, the crowd were really waiting for him... Because uh, people are angry. Um, and they want to be told that they're in the right and they're right to be angry. And he did the opposite, I think. He dampened expectations. He said this, a museum can only do so much. And um, I think the outgoing president uh, was right on that matter. So to draw my comments to a close, the past has always been used, but it's being used in brutal 
and deleterious ways today. Um, instead of leaders, we have victims. Um, instead of confronting present-day problems out with the museum and culture, instead of kind of finding out what we need to do to make a better world, uh, we're looking towards the past to evade that problem. And we are, as a result, losing knowledge. So the Museum of Native American Museum means we are losing knowledge and we cannot ask questions about the past because it is no longer um, open to everybody. Uh, the the kind of answers have been predetermined and who can ask and make those comments have been decided on the basis of ethnicity. So I'd like to see struggles for a better present and future directed outside culture, more realistic expectations of what we ask of objects. They cannot make apologies for colonization. They can tell us about, in the case of the Bed and Bronzes, a particular kingdom at a particular time, and they can be inspiring in a number of different ways. We need to reconnect and find the purpose of culture as one that is investigatory, investigatory and not political. Because there is so much about which to be curious, to be inspired by, uh, but too many, I think, have lost sight of the value of culture. To research, to display when it comes, display when it comes to museums, what artifacts can tell us about human civilizations. That is enough when it comes to museums. It is a rich and fruitful project, and I think we need to stop apologizing, start investigating, and valuing the role of culture for being culture and nothing more. Thank you. Let's see. Thank you very much, Tiffany, for uh, opening up the discussion for the next couple of days in such an inspiring and thought-provoking way. I'm sure that a lot of us has a lot of questions and um, opinions and oomphs and ahs, and I hope that you'll um, post those questions to Tiffany in a moment. But I'd like first for us to just talk between ourselves a little, and then we'll open up to the audience, if that's okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you. It's great to have you here, and I know you've been so busy over the last many months promoting your book, Keeping Their Marbles. Um, I read it when it first came out, and I found it immensely liberating. And uh, it is pretty razor sharp at times, but also very elegantly and generously written. So it's sort of um, easy to take in, I think, um, and I highly recommend it. But I wanted to talk about um, something which you explore a lot in the book, which is, or promote rather, which is the concept of uh, universalism. And last year, for those of you who were at Tusmert, that Kenan Malik opened, he gave the keynote speak, and he spoke about the problems and um, or what he thinks as the problems and pitfalls of multiculturalism. The way that uh, multiculturalist policies can uh, create um, distinction between people, and um, he, ca he calls it cultural enclaves or silos, building walls between people. And instead he, he talked about the possibilities of um, universalism, which is looking at um, culture as a shared human experience, a shared human um, condition, rather. And this is something you do, and you explore it more particularly for, for heritage. And also you explore it for the values of heritage. You say that heritage objects in museums and elsewhere environments are they're interesting and attractive because of their unfamiliarity, because of their mm. mystery to some extent. They are interesting because they are uh, timeless to some extent, and and they they, are, they sort of transcend time and place. And so I'm interested in that kind of universal aspects of uh, heritage. And another thing you said recently at a 
discussion at the uh, um, London School of Economics about the Global Museum. You were talking about the purpose, okay, you were talking about that now, but the purpose of um, the cultural institution and particularly the heritage institution. And you said it was preservation, truth and access. Mm. And I think for many of us here, we'll recognize part of that. The strap line of the heritage board here is, or the bits of it is um, bevara or använda. So that's preservation and access. But I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you about the truth bit. Is that a universal concept or how, how do you think about the truth bit of that? Um, th th the truth is a universal concept. It is open to everyone and it is a kind of constant open question. The truth is, is always provisional. Um, I think no matter what your identity is, you can access and try and find out the truth which is communicable to everyone. But you know, even, stand, even though I believe that, and standing here, I feel sometimes I have to say truth with a kind of qualification around it because it is so problematized and it, it has been subject to such scrutiny um, within the academy and out with the academy. I think if you, if you say truth today, you have to kind of, you feel like you have to apologize when it is, when we should be unashamedly ambitious about finding the truth. Um, in institutions, in the academy, in museums, there are things that happened that you can discover, uh, but you have to try and do so. And I think people have become a little bit ashamed and uncomfortable about that possibility. And it's extremely, it's extremely dangerous. And it is, it does kind of relate to your first question about universality. So now you have truths rather than truth. And you have truth that is partial to particular communities. Um, that's what you have with the Museum of the American Indian, the idea that they have a truth about their past. And even if it goes against established knowledge that is prov properly established, then it doesn't really matter because what matters to them is what's important and what's true. And it's a dereliction of our commitment to truth and understanding, which is really important and should not be underestimated as the difficult project but worthwhile project that it is. In the discussions around universality, it's often very clear um, how fragmentary it is when people start talking about their culture. Um, you've had this with the debates over cultural appropriation, which you may have had here, you know, Justin Bieber can't, shouldn't wear drug locks, dreadlocks because they're African, um, which is a more ridiculous one. But it's, extre it's extreme now, and it is having a really serious impact upon, I think, creativity, and on our way in which uh, we relate to the arts. The thing about universality is that it wasn't just that you had this kind of, it was, it was a discussion really about the audience as much as anything else. So in the 19th century, when you had these institutions being built, um, museum institutions being built, there was the notion that anybody could come. The British Museum was free from the day it opened. Anybody could come, women. I mean, there were many discussions about at the Louvre, at the Ashmolean. There were many concerns about women running around and touching objects, which were reflecting the anxieties of the time. But the point is, they were there, and they could go. And there was the kind of idea then that regardless of if you, were, if you had a uterus, regardless of where you were from, you could come in here, in this institution, and see and understand something. Whereas I think today that respect for the audience, the respect that they are capable, competent adults, they're intelligent, rational beings, the respect that they can leave their home, leave their children, leave the poverty of their circumstances and go to something and be inspired by ancient Athens or wherever. That respect is gone because we no longer see people as capable of making that leap. Instead, I think uh, the way in which the audience, the public, is often seen as a bit th confined to their own circumstances. So we have things, th you know, cultural institutions will try and go to them and reflect them, uh, put a mirror up and say, look, this is, we, we do everything that you want, we do everything that you can have in your own home, rather than stretching them. And I think it's a real disrespect for people. You talk about, you call it the crisis of authority, don't you, as well? And um, 
So, I mean, there, there's several aspects to the crisis of authority, and one of them is judgment, mm. value judgment. And um, so, would you, I mean, if we say that taste, which you talked about to mm -hmm. begin with, uh, which is a sort of concept to do, but that might be the value judgment of art, but it's not used so much anymore. Uh, and what would be the val value judgment of heritage? Would that be truth then, or knowledge? Well, they're truth and knowledge are very linked. Um, I think it's just it's an investigation into the past, what happened, what it meant to people, and the creativity that it resulted in. Um, but I think people are afraid of making judgments, actually. And, what? Um, and I think I think the thing about it is that it's almost like it's almost kind of almost like a private thing. So I'm always amazed that. It, leaders of cultural institutions who I want to, who I expect to be experts, I expect them to know more than I do about whatever it is their specialism is, um, are often reticent about kind of, are often reticent about making judgments in public. They obviously make curatorial decisions all the time, but justifying them in public, which means going out there and saying, this is why I think it. Um, I think that doesn't happen often enough. And it's almost like judgment is something that you can have on your own, but you can't have with others. I think one of the things about making judgments um, isn't that we just come to them organically. We're in our home and we read a magazine and we know what we think. It's that you're there argued over and argued for, and you try and persuade people. And I think that's something that people find difficult. Exactly. It's the act of persuasion, which means I think this is great, which is what we do with our friends if we've got a piece of music. We think, this is really good. But cultural institutions are more apologetic than they used to be and should be. So they, they say, well, it's just, you know, don't worry about my opinion. I don't know what I'm talking about. It's what you think that's important. That's disrespectful. It's disrespectful of the culture, and it's disrespectful of the audience. And it's, there's something disingenuous about it as well. And I think if you think about how canons are made, as in not the things that fire balls, but qualities, uh, a kind of hierarchy of judgment about what is good, which is forever shifting, but they are all consequences of critical conflicts where people put their reputation on the line and say, I think this is good. You know, Beckett is brilliant. Go back and see him. When he was first played, everybody thought he was no good. And the critics, critics also have been really devalued, were the ones to say, go back and take a second look and encourage people to go, which means saying, I think this is good and I think you should too. The should is really important. It's not just, I think this is good. I think you should too. And that's when you create, I think, that's when you foster a culture that allows people to, well, that encourages people to engage in the arts and also shapes the future canon, otherwise we're not taking responsibility for it. And um, what do you think we've lost with the loss of judgment, value judgment? A number of lost. things. I mean, I think, I mean, there's a lot out there, um, whether it's in museums or galleries or any kind of cultural activity that we are not appreciating and that means, if we're not appreciating it, why should our children or future generations? Why should they, if we haven't said that this is good? I think it could well be the case that there has a, there's a major impact upon new creativity um, in a critical environment. You know, you have, you have these flourishings. If you look across history, the Renaissance is the most obvious time, but you have a number of conditions in place. Money is important but also so is critical engagement. And if you don't have critical engagement, where do the artists get their ideas from? I mean, they might get them in their garret or on a walk, but you know, creativity is related to the culture in which helps to create it. And then there's the more serious stuff. I mean, I've gone on a, at length about the Museum of the American Indian, but what you have in America is the Native Americans who were there first, but we, ha we, we, we know less about them than we ever did. We can't ask those questions. And when I say we, that's you know, scholars, that's the public. There are new hidden histories. And so I think that's quite serious. But there is, I mean, opinion is a term that we can discuss, but because actually there's a lot of opinion today. People do, uh, but an, an opinion is siding with a side in an argument. It's not about 
truth and taste, perhaps, to, s to some extent. But um, I wanted to ask you about relevance. I know this is a, a word. That relevance. You've got, <laughs> yes, you've yeah. got a problem with that. And you said in that um, discussion at the London School of Economics, you were talking about um, heritage institutions making relevance, um, making heritage relevant to a target audience, and how that is not a good way, uh, you argued, to open up opinions or to broaden an, an audience. In fact, it might be the opposite. And what, what then, how, sh or even, I think you said that, uh, some outreach activities and audience development activities are not at all to do with democratization, which is what we've normally thought they are. So what should we be doing as heritage institutions in order to reach as many people as possible and in order to make sure that as many people as possible can understand heritage? I think you have to believe in it, which sounds a bit like motivational talk. But I, I am struck by, uh, when I interview heritage professionals, uh, how beleaguered they often feel, um, and how they believe in it, but feel underconfident about putting the case, um, and how often the concern is so much about, well, will they come? Why don't they like us? Why won't they come? Um, that it ends up having a kind of destabilizing effect. So I think the confidence is key, but that comes from the object, um, the object of the exercise to curate, to understand, to show. Um, and then obviously, you know, like any good act of seduction, you have to put some bells and whistles on it. I mean, you try, you try out what works. I think one of the most telling things though, particularly in Britain, is that for all the obsession with relevance that you've had with cultural institutions for uh, probably about really since the 1990s. Uh, m more people have come, but the same people. And they've become more irritated with the quality because they think they're being talked down to, which they are. Um, but they haven't changed considerably the audience demographics, so it's just not working. Either because you're putting people... I mean, I think they're probably putting people off. It's also OK if not everybody comes. You know, they're, they're, I mean, we think this stuff's important, and it is. But not a, you don't want to lose, get rid of it to get anybody in. And that's the state where you have, I mean, that's where you've got, I mean, and a number of institutions in Britain that were set up without a collection in the hope that the audience will come. Um, you know, the idea of no collection is that the building will do all the talking and it doesn't really matter what's inside it, but just please come. Huge funded, you know, funded by a lot of arts council money and it doesn't come. So I think also people know when they're, being patronized. But there's almost a kind of equation of if the audience like it, it's good. It's not necessarily the case. Obviously, you want the audience to like it, you want an audience. But there's a kind of, there's been a chasing of the audience, which is one of the reasons why it's become the obsession with relevance means, you know, like you've had a concern that 14 year old boys don't go to museums. Well, I was, that didn't happen when I was a child, and that's fine because they've got better things to do, really. 14-year-old boys, and they will grow up. They will grow up, but if, if, if the heritage sector doesn't have confidence in its central purpose, then why should the audience? I think that's the most important mm -hmm. thing. In the, um, the vision that the Heritage Board has produced with uh, the county um, administration, county, what do we call you, Landstyrsna? There you go, the Thank county you. administrative boards. Um, so this vision, it does, at the heart of it is um, the heritage, the object, the sites, the landscape, whatever, and um, saying that, so again, the role of the heritage institutions is to make sure that it's there, it's to provide well-preserved heritage, if you like. And then there is, and now we're sort of talking about instrumentalization, I think, because, um, but I would call it something else, I'd call it causality or something, because what happens mm -hmm. then is that uh, we make sure it's accessible and that people can come and explore it, uh, but we don't tell them how to explore it. In the next step, and this is where we come to the social inclusion bit, uh, or the social uh, sustainability, we argue that, um, okay, so if you do, if you're a person who come in, explore the past, you're curious about 
um, perhaps uh, understanding something which seems unknowable and different. Um, this may open your mind up to other ways of living, other ways of understanding the world. And this in turn, and this is the causality effect, this in turn will hopefully make you more um, adaptable in, in society mm. today, which is very complex. I don't think yeah, you'd agree with that, would you? I wouldn't agree with that, but it's, you, we all know that those are buzzwords that kind of don't mean all that much. Um, and do you, we want people to be more adaptable? Is that a good thing? I don't know if it is a good thing. Maybe, I mean, maybe that was the wrong, different word, wrong actually, word. Yeah. But it just doesn't, it doesn't work like that, does it? We all know that. I mean, culture has an impact. Um, but it's unquantifiable, intangible, sometimes entirely contrary to what uh, you would like it to be. I mean, we've all read those kind of... The, or, you know, if you listen to audiences or if you read the audience comments about an exhibition after they leave it. It is often not what was intended. And that is a good thing because, you know, people are people and they're autonomous and they're their own people. And um, that's a really good thing. And so I don't think it's kind of malleable like that. It always fails. I was really struck, actually. I'm sure you've been following Brexit. Um, but in the last you know, 20 years, people in Britain have been obsessed with getting... Uh, the working class and different kind of um, minority groups into their uh, institutions. They failed to do so. Um, and they also failed to have any sense that th those people were going to vote or anybody was going to vote to leave. Like they had not one clue, despite all their audience programs. And I think what, they, what you end up doing is just replicating what you think in the idea, in the name of other people, if that makes sense. I think this is a good moment to open up <laughs> to all of your <laughs> <laughs> questions. Um, and there are two roving mics and two people with very orange shirts. Um, and yeah. please yeah. don't speak until you got the mic. And if you could um, just state your name, that'd be grand, please. Have we got any? Any hands? Oh, go on. And also, if you want to put your question or your comment in Swedish, I'd be happy to tra translate. Nope, no. Well, I've got it, okay. <laughs> Can we have a microphone here, please? Thank you, thank you very much. Let's see if it comes on. Yes, I, I'm just curious, Tiffany. I, um, my name is Lars Amrius. You saw me on the stage earlier. Um, I'm just curious, Tiffany. You, you speak of museums, um, certainly in the Anglo-Saxon world. I know you've worked in Norway as well, so you're sort of familiar with the Scandinavian. But, but this that you're talking about is, is, is this a global Western phenomena? Would you, would you say? Uh, or, or do we see differences in, in heritage institutions, museums handling these kind of issues in, in different parts of Europe, for instance? Could you just elaborate mm. a little bit uh, around that? Thank you. When Karen sent me the vision, the provisional provision document, it was like I was reading something that had been written um, in Britain a few years earlier. Um, and I'm sure there's this kind of cut and paste cultural policy a uh, cultural heritage guide that everybody can use. But I think it's, there's something more profound there as well, um, which is you have uh, culture here. Culture can do this. And whatever is fashionable um, broadly, whatever is a good thing, then that's the word that you add. So sustainability is one of those words. Social inclusion for a while. Um, um, raising self-esteem for a while. Um, and it it's, is a global phenomenon. There are differences. So, and I think the differences relate to the um, confidence and purpose in what culture is for. Uh, that's not always a good thing. But so France is certainly a little bit further behind on these discussions. America is very robust in many ways. You know, you've got a very strong philanthropic tradition, you've got some of the best collections in the world, but even there, they are unconfident about um, truth 
preservation and access with that truth and preservation. Now, when I say I'm confident, you might be thinking, but we all feel really confident. Or uh, It's a very difficult thing to um, describe accurately because nobody goes around saying, I'm really unconfident, come and I need some kind of, I need to rediscover my purpose. But if you look at all Western institutions, not just cultural ones, you will see that they have changed dramatically their remit and their purpose away from the object to something more nebulous and social. Um, in, uh, higher education is a really uh, important example of this. You know, institutions of higher learning are obsessed with access at the same time as they're obsessed with trying to either be useful to government, whatever the government of the day might be, um, and useful to the economy. And actually, they're not useful to either very much so, but they have suffered a similar crisis of purpose and lack of confidence in cultural value and the value of what they do, and are therefore really sus um, vulnerable to um, all sorts of uh, whatever might be fashionable at the time. And I think there's something else that's quite interesting, which is that um, the global... I mean, Karen mentioned I just did this discussion with the director of the Guggenheim, who's setting up all these global museums, museums across the globe. And um, the use of the word global and world is really uh, frequent now. So the British Museum was the first institution with the prefix British. Um, it doesn't, it still calls itself the British Museum, but it's very keen to make the point that it's a museum of the world, because um, it's much more politically neutral. Um, there are some things that are more acceptable and some things that are not. So national museums are increasingly something that people feel uncomfortable with, with the exception of identity museums. So certain identities are okay, ethnicity, uh, indigeneity, but English, that's something that people feel very really uncomfortable with. British, that's something that people feel uncomfortable with, and to a degree, American. And so I think you're seeing a kind of a very broad almost self-loathing in many Western institutions, which is not good. Is there anyone who'd like to say something about Swedish? Swedishness. Ah. <laughs> yeah. I've been looking at... Uh, there's a, so in the 19th century, you had the kind of birth of the Na National Museum that was part of kind of various different national projects. Uh, and they manifested that kind of that nationalism in a variety of ways. British Museum actually had nothing British inside its collection, despite being called the British Museum. It more kind of surveyed the world. And one thing you have now is the um, proliferation of museums around migration um, and immigration. It's the really big trend in cultural institutions. And the interesting thing about those institutions, and I visited them across the world, is that they all make the same point, which is that we are all migrants. Obviously, that's true in many ways. I mean, everybody has a migrant story. But I think it is really interesting that institutions that once talked about the nation state now denounce it as almost being a temporary, uh, momentary thing. So there's, there are new ideologies at work in that, um, which is curious. I'm just thinking about the, the instrumentality and the truth, if there's, there's a sort of polar here in this discussion. Why can't we have both? Would that not be possible? Because th there's always going to be an element of instrumentality, isn't there? Especially in organizations and institutions that are funded by, uh, uh. publicly funded. Um, well, public funding um, hasn't always demanded so much. Um, it hasn't always demanded certain audiences, certain numbers. It hasn't always demanded that it does things that are not in the language of culture. So in Britain, all the policy documents for some time would talk about social inclusion and community. That's not the language of culture. Culture may be, may be those things that may be against those things. So I think you've seen a sea change in what government in particular asks of the arts and of the cultural sector. Um, which is much narrower. So if we think back to the uh, what, 19th century, so the National Gallery in Britain, in London, was uh, 
came about because of a Tory prime minister wanted to put it in between the poor and the wealthy. It's now all the wealthy, but that's a different story. That's a different problem. Um, and he said, this is sort of 1860, in the times of um, unrest, um, this may soothe, this gallery may help to soothe those kind of unrestful feelings and basically stop people becoming uh, protesting and demanding the vote and demanding better representation. Um, he, that did not happen, but they, we did get a really good gallery. But if you think, how does that instrumentality differ? It differs perhaps in, two, in a number of ways that I think are important. Number one, he knew what to put in the collection. So there was a confidence that it needed to be, you know, Raphael, Titian, Michelangelo, Rembrandt. So there was a confidence in a canon. Um, that's not the case now, which is really a paradoxical thing. So culture's being asked to do all sorts of things at the same time as we don't know what culture is. I mean, that just doesn't work. But I think also the instrumentality and the purpose that culture was asked to be put to was different. It was about this big stuff, wasn't it? It's uplift, it's transformation. Um, there was an idea that it could take people from their everyday lives and take them somewhere else. And actually, culture does do that. It doesn't change your life. It just provides solace and all sorts of things. But it doesn't, like, it doesn't give you more money and it doesn't give you a better house and all those sort of things. And I think the kind of language of instrumentality is much narrower. Um, it is self-esteem, community, these things that, it's, that I think it will not be able to achieve and are very difficult to measure and isn't really about what culture can do. And it's probably more disrespectful of people because it's not about taking them somewhere else to introduce them to something great. It's saying, and here's your culture, and we will represent it to you, and look, now you feel better, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Does that make sense? There's a question over here. Yes, I'd like to ask a question to you, Tiffany. Oh, sorry, I should say who I am. Okay, I'm Karin Skoglund. I'm managing a smaller museum, uh, or a large museum, um, as, a, as one artist's personal collection of stuff from all around the world, and buildings as well. But what I'd like to know, is there anywhere a movement within any museum of thinking before they get asked, give this back, give this back, we, we should have this. Is, is any museum actually formulating um, well, a, a, a good reason for this to be on display here instead of just giving it back? Because this has been going on for quite a few years now about people claiming their stuff mm. for ideological reasons. And, and do you know if, if anything's going on to sort of yeah. formulate good reasons for keeping it public? That there are people formulating reasons for retention. Um, probably the most successful is, uh, was Neil McGregor at the British Museum. So the British Museum is obviously a real focal point for demands because it's such a big and important institution. And often demands are as much about kind of accusation and complaining as it is getting something back. Because, I mean, actually when... Things are returned that, that you can no longer make the kind of claim, you can no longer use it as a political weapon, and it's awkward because uh, you've got to do something with the objects that are often better suited for, for museums. Um, but I think the fact that he cannot uh, argue for the museum uh, in simple terms of preservation, truth, and access to the past. He cannot do that, tells you something about the temper of the time. So one of the most successful museum leaders in the world cannot say that. Instead, he has to say something that's much more political um, and instrumental and probably not true, which is that he talks up the problems of nationalism with places like Turkey, um, Hungary, and he says, this institution can help us defeat that by talking about the complexity of culture. And it's a global museum, not a British museum. So there's a slight defensiveness in there and an overreach, which I think probably overstates the problems of nationalism and um, kind of says that it will do something to solve it, which it will not. It does show the complexity of cultures, but not always. And that is not its purpose. Um, I think that... Repatriation issue is really, obviously I'd say this, repatriation issue is really interesting because it's not just about groups asking for things back. 
I see it as about um, one of the, so in the last 30 years, you've had a huge rise in claims for return from all sorts of different groups, which I think reflects the, the way in which culture is asked to do political things. I think it also reflects a kind of lack of belief in what museums are for, so they're no longer, if, if we don't know what they're for, why should they have their stuff? Why not just give it back? Um, there are many cases where the institution itself almost invites claims or even makes the claim themselves. And this happens particularly in America with Native American communities. So museum leaders have contacted time and time and time again Native American communities to say, look, we've got your stuff. Um, please come and take it. Some cases they do, in other cases they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> We've got other things to be getting on with. We're quite happy with the institution having this, um, having this stuff. Now in Denver recently, they had these African totems and they'd been acquired legitimately, they're very popular, uh, but the curator there contacted Africa for five years. He, I mean, this is not a country that wanted them back. <laughs> For five years, he wrote to them and said, please, please, please take this stuff. And finally, they said, all right, but if you pay for the return. And he said, yes. So there's the complicated dynamic there. And it's very easy to say oh, it's just claimant groups. It's not. Institutions, through either not valuing what they do or for not thinking it's their role to kind of preserve and understand culture, kind of are pushing those artifacts away as much as there's a pull from out, outside the institution. We've got a question just here. Put your hand up, please. I mean, that just to bang on a bit about the Oxford example. So Oxford, these are students that are demanding the return of the Ben and Bronzes. Anyway. Well, I'm Mia Geier. I'm from the country administrative board of Örebro, in central Sweden. Uh, I was rather intrigued by your starting your, your lecture saying uh, culture, heritage is always political. And then you've been talking about universality and you've been talking about objectivity. And the recent debate of museums in Sweden has been very much about uh, objectivity contra identity. But I was thinking about, would you please say something about what is the difference between universality and objectivity? Because in my opinion, there is no such thing as objectivity. There's no such thing as objectivity? No, because we are, as researchers or curators or whatever our purpose is, or, or uh, message, uh, well, whatever, whatever uh, mission is, uh, we are always steered by the ideas in our times. And those ideas will always be uh, the acts of human, human beings as political beings. So I was very intrigued. Is there mm. such, have you, have you ever thought about the difference between universality and objectivity? Um, well, I should say, I think it's, objectivity as a researcher is really hard. And it is, it's, gosh, I mean, we, we fight it all to, every day um, in our act of reading and writing. And we know our own biases. Um, and then there are those that we don't know. And then there are what, you know, biases of the time and biases of the community. It's really hard, uh, but it is something you strive for, because once you give it away, um, you no longer challenge yourself, you no longer seek truth, um, and you no longer seek to test it. That's one reason why kind of publishing and writing and speaking is so important, because you're putting your um, opinions, your research up to be tested in, the, in, the, in a public arena, which is when I think you help to shape uh, what is accepted as generally right. Um, you were asking about its relationship to universality, is that right? Discussion on a po political level, I believe. So saying that there is something like that is universally true would mean would be true beyond time and place. And that is what is intriguing. Yes. Contra, well, if you put it as a, uh, in connection to objectivity, because there is a general belief, I think, in society that as a society, you will, scientist, you will be objective. But obviously, you can't ever be objective over, over time and space. 
But you try, don't you? I mean, you try. Uh, you try really hard. And um, that's one reason why you have to have as open and free investigation into the past and the present as possible, and as critical as possible. So you need as much free speech as is possible. Um, it's hard, um, but you have to... I mean, th there is such a thing. I do also think... I mean, I'm just thinking about the Elgin marbles in that example. So I did begin my talk by talking about the number of different meanings they have had. Um, I think most of those we can understand now and engage with, and the kind of... T uh, being able to look back on the past is one way to see both how meanings change, but that we can understand what those meanings are, uh, because we are competent, capable, rational beings. So even when we may disagree, it's a kind of reflection of the possibility of objectivity and universality, because we're talking about the same thing. It's a struggle. Well, the point is actually what I think is we can, as, as professionals, we can never take the easy way out saying, well, this is universal, of universal value, so therefore we have a right to exist. Uh, mm -hmm. Telling the truth, aiming to tell the truth will always be the struggle of our profession. And there is no such thing as one single truth. And we, do, we can't take that easy way out. That's why I want yeah, to Yeah, no, I think question. that's fair. I mean, I'd say the truth is always provisional. Um, partial, provisional, but you, you try and get to it. Got another question here, which is probably the last one. Mm. Uh, my name is Birgitta Johansson, uh, also from Örebro, but the county museum. And I find what you say very liberating and refreshing, but at the same time, you still have to keep your critical mind working. Uh, so I'm just wondering, might there be cases where museums should leave things back to groups or other countries or yeah, whatever? Hmm. Possibly. I mean, what I try and do in the book is look at why you've had the rise in claims for return. So ever since uh, the Romans went around and took everything um, and brought it back to having those amazing triumphs, there have been debates about the rights and wrongs of plunder. Uh, but in the last 30 years, those debates have changed considerably. So they become bigger. Everybody's aware of them. I mean, previously, people were not outside the, our, our, you know, our world were not that interested in them, and they've become really important. And so I set out to explore why, and it's the whys that make me really uncomfortable. So one of the whys is that the rise in identity politics so the idea that objects belong to a particular culture. So the Benin bronzes are African. I have reservations about that. I mean, for a start, you know, technically Nigeria didn't exist when the Benin bronzes were created. It doesn't help us to understand them through the prism of Africanness when they were, you know, made as as a as a diktat as a consequence of the diktat by a Benin king, and um, they were made out of. Manilas, which were brass plates bought by the Portuguese in exchange for slaves. So very kind of, uh, to approach it as one culture owns it is, is wrong on a number of different ways and doesn't help us understand those artifacts. And I just think it's really unfortunate to see things through the prism of identity in that way. It kind of, I mean, we can all look at those Ben and bronzes and think they're mad, fascinating, elegant, exciting, no matter wh where we are from. Um, and I think that's, I think it's a, the kind of the growth of identity politics is really unfortunate. So that's one reason why I'm uncomfortable at return on the basis of identity. I also don't think it can, objects can repair the past. Um, I think it turns them into objects of atonement, not enlightenment. And it turns to institutions to do things that they cannot do. And I think it's the wrong question to ask. I think the question to ask about an object is where, does it, where is it best for the object? Uh, that could, there are a number of answers that result from that. So the Parthenon marbles, I think the status quo is brilliant, actually. And that is half in Athens and half at the British Museum. At the British Museum, you can see them in a number of different contexts in relationship to the Assyrians, to the Egyptians, to the Greeks. You can better understand the specificity of ancient Athens that way. 
um, and you can also understand them, not just their original life, but the life that they had when they came onto the world stage in the 19th century, um, when you know everybody was suddenly captivated by them. Um, and in the, in the Acropolis Museum, you can see them in the context of pre-classical sculptures. So if you ask, where is it best that this object is for preservation, for truth, for access, that's the questions, not where is it best for me, who owns this? It's an entirely different question. Then I think you know the Parthenon is pretty good where it is. I mean, you could send it to China, but I think it's pretty good where it is. I mean, it wouldn't be. I think it's probably better to send it to China than ancient than um, Athens. Um, but that's just me being unobjective. That's something to talk about. In lunch. <laughs> I think <laughs> there's one more question, and that'll be the last one before lunch. My name is Feras Hamami. I'm from University of Gothenburg. Do you want to hold it? Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, I would like to start by, say, by referring to the, uh, the minister uh, uh, citation, nobody owns the past. And then instead of keeping it or returning it, there is a growing talk or debates about uh, sharing it. And one example can be the mutual uh, foreign policy for the, for the Dutch government, you know, sharing the uh, Indonesian uh, or the colonial heritage from Indonesia with the Indonesian uh, society. There is another example with the European Mid, uh, a program, you know, sharing the, uh, the heritage of the um, kind of Western um, times in the, uh, in the Mediterranean uh, areas, especially Arab, Arab countries. And now I would like to ask you your reflection on um, what do you think about such kind of debates about mutuality in heritage or sharing rather than keeping or returning? And what role does the museum have in this context? Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure, it, I'm genuinely not sure it means anything, sharing the past. <laughs> I mean, what, was, what were people doing beforehand? Were they keeping it? I don't think so. Um, I think there's a kind of, there's a kind of, I don't know enough about the specifics, but I think it's, it's political gobbledygook in all seriousness. Because you think, of course, you are, if you're involved in researching and displaying the past, then of course, I mean, it will probably go out to other people. It may or may not, but you're, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily your objective. It makes me feel slightly uncomfortable. I mean, I also think when I've seen that this kind of uh, language used is that it's done in the terms of trying to give people a stake in society. Um, obviously, there's many things are tumultuous and there isn't a sense really of a certainly in Britain the debates over immigration there's a massive debate about giving people a stake in society but what is really interesting about it is that it comes at a time when people are very defensive about the past and the British past so at the same time as talking about sharing it it's also being dismissed and I think you cannot use the past in that way to give people a kind of a stake in society. I think it's probably an evasion of coming up with values and beliefs that people should buy into in the here and now and using the past to try and do it for them at a time when nobody believes the past is a good thing. I mean, it's a mess, I think. I think this is a... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> This is a discussion that can go on for two days now, um, but we have to round up. Uh, I have one very quick last question, and it's where would you, this is a sort of Desert Island disc, Desert okay. Island Museum. Where would you go to be challenged, amazed? Where would you go for enlightenment? You've got three, three museums or, or sites to bring to your Desert Island. Okay, the Met, for obvious reasons. In New York, it has I mean, it has absolutely everything, and it's beautifully arranged. Uh, there's a new museum in Cairo that's opening, hopefully, in the next few years. I think that would be incredible. And then the Museum of Iraq, which is in a state, but it has the most amazing stuff from the birth of human civilization. So if I could package them up and put them on the, on the island, I'd be very happy. What about one heritage site? Because there are people here who represent the sort of... Yes, I am heritage. a bit museum-focused, it has been said. Um, two. You can have two sites. <laughs> well, I really like the Viking boats in... Um, They're still in a the museum. Okay. <laughs> 
if they're in the water. Um, heritage sites, oh my goodness. Does the Acropolis count? Yeah. Yeah, let's go for the Acropolis. I mean, come on, ancient Athens. No British ones? Stonehenge? I'm afraid no? Britain, whenever I have the debate over keeping their marbles, and pe people say, well, what if, what if we ask for Stonehenge back? And you just think, fine, <laughs> take it. <laughs> I'm afraid. It, it, was not, um, it was not in many ways the most creative of places when it comes to producing beautiful heritage sites. So Tiffany is here for two days, I think. Mm -hmm. You're here tomorrow as well, and uh, you're happy for people to come and talk to you? Please do. But yes. for now, please join me in thanking Tiffany for this introduction. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll leave for you. <laughs> A small gift from uh, World Heritage in Visby.